Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to Inside the Black Box Live, part of the Pixel Core Live series here on Thursday night. Six o'clock is when we're doing it every week. Uh, uh, this week we have Inside the Black Box. Next week we're going to have um, uh, Mac Break Studio. Uh, and we have Steve, uh, Steve Martin and uh, Mark Spencer coming in. And then the week after that we're doing a Halloween photography uh, project with Frederick Johnson. And so, uh, so that should be a lot of fun uh, with uh, TWIP Live. So doing this every, every Thursday at 6 o'clock. So um, hopefully yeah, you will enjoy it. Tonight we actually have kind of a little bit of a different thing. We've been doing a lot of, um, you know, a lot of things that we've had, you know, kind of uh, planned out. But we get a lot of questions and we can't get to all of them. And so what we've decided to do as an experiment, and this might turn out to be a really bad experiment. Uh, I'm here, by the way, with Kevin Hansen. Who, nice shirt. You, you, you blend. <laughs> hey, everybody. <laughs> actually, it actually my is, it's disembodied is head. Yeah, your disembodied Ooh. head. Oh, and, uh, actually, you can see the shirt pretty well. But we're trying this experiment. We'll see how, how whether this experiment actually uh, uh, works well or not. Uh, but uh, the um, the experiment is uh, whether we can. Uh, uh, whether people have enough questions for us to just simply do a show, uh, an open question show. Uh, we've had some complaints that we don't get to all the questions, so we thought we'd give it a shot, and uh, we're going to see how that goes. Uh, while we're stacking up questions, right now we don't have any questions. Um, while we're stacking up questions, and of course if you're watching this stream, remember you can click and then ask the questions there. And uh, while, you're stack while we're stacking up some questions, what we're going to do is I'm going to show you a little bit of some stuff that I've been kind of noodling about with, uh, which is um, some of the physics and some of the new rendering. Uh, that is available in um, in uh, Cinema 4D. Uh, now we're going to be showing a lot of different applications inside the black box. Uh, we, you know, our you know we're going to be actually showing um, Moto, uh, XSI, a couple other 3D applications in the coming weeks. Uh, this week, because it's uh, pretty fresh and new, uh, I thought I would show a little bit of uh, of inside the black box. I mean, a little bit of uh, Cinema 4D. So, um, so that's what we're showing tonight. Um, anyway, so here is. Uh, some render tests uh, that I put together. Um, this is just some really rough stuff that I've been kind of uh, playing with. So here is, um, uh, let me uh, actually get this in the foreground here. So here you have um, just some, let's loop this. There we go. So this is a, uh, a, little, uh, a little test here. There you go. So what I did here is this is actually, um, you know, years ago, this is not, you know, th this is something that a lot of applications have been starting to add. And so whether you're into doing uh, a lot of 3D or not, it's just a lot of fun to play with. And what you can see here is a uh, brick wall. I built that with what, what's called a replicator. I'll show this in a, in a little bit, uh, show you kind of how this all works. But I built this in a replicator, and then I just put that ball on a hinge and just let the ball go. So while in the past you would have had to try to animate that and make it all look right and make it all work, um, in this case I was able to just simply stack up a big wall and uh, run something through it. Now there's a couple other things going on. I, I, I've also been doing some rendering tests. Um, and so one of the things that you may notice here is the, uh, as you look in here, is a lot of nice uh, motion blur uh, that we're seeing uh, you know, through here, throughout here as well as some um, depth of field. So if we get a couple of them that are getting close, you'll see that this is a little bit out of focus here. So I've been kind of playing with the, the new physical renderer that's, um, that's inside, of, uh, inside of a cinema. And it's actually pretty impressive. One of my big complaints about cinema for a long time, uh, we like doing a lot of uh, cinema work, but one of my complaints was that, that we, uh, um, you know, it was a little bit of trouble to, uh, to get depth of field and to get that stuff there. So, so anyway, it's, um, so this is a, one example here. Let me, um, let me show you another. Uh, here's, here's another angle of something similar. I did, I did a slightly different angle here. So um, the reason these are just short tests, these were just kind of to, to kind of play with the idea. So you can see that you know, all of that, trying to calculate all of that rolling, you know, these rolling boxes that are kind of rolling over uh, you know, the, the, uh, the sphere. Uh, is usually something that you know would take a lot of time to try to figure out, and so by having a um, you know implicit uh, control over this, uh, you can have a lot of fun with it. And so, it, but it doesn't take a lot to, um, to put this together. I'll show you a couple other examples of, of things that I haven't rendered yet as well. Uh, and once again, if you have any questions about this or about other things in visual effects, um, you can go up to our feedback loop and uh, and ask them. So let me uh, let's go to another. Uh, Another example here. Now this one is a little bit more complicated. Um, what you can see here is, uh, we'll pop this up. So uh, here we go. So these are. So what I did is I built a little funnel, 
uh, I just simply you know wrapped a little funnel and then I literally just took a, a built kind of a cluster of balls uh, out with a um, uh, with a replicator and then I just let them go so there wasn't I'm not doing anything I'm not, I'd love to say that I animated these very well but all I did is set up a bunch of rules and then let them roll and that's kind of the the fun uh, aspect of um, doing this kind of uh, you know physics simulations the balls are bouncing off of each other they're bouncing off of the, the surface um, and then again uh, we're using the physical renderer to uh, get the uh, depth of field that you have there instead of trying to set up a certain um, you know depth of field in and out and so on and so forth what we're actually doing here is uh, you know just saying I've got 50 millimeter lens and it's 1.4 aperture and then it just figures out what, you know, and I say, and my focus point is this point. And that's pretty much all I had to do to calculate all of that. Turned on the uh, uh, global illumination and just let it, let it do its thing. So, um, so it's kind of a fun little, uh, fun little process there as far as uh, doing that stuff. So the, um, uh, one of the questions that we had from Chris Tuttle uh, is, uh, do, did I have to specify the physics of the floor the bricks fall on? And you do, you specify it in a specific way, so. Uh, let me uh, let me show you this. Let's start a new new project here. So um, if I have a project here and I can um, you know build a build a, uh, a plane here like this. Now I don't you know basically what you do is you're just going to add a bunch of tags. Now this was available before, so so you you were able to do uh, this type of physics calculation uh, in the past. Uh, the the main thing was is that you were um, you had to do it all through MoGraph, and so basically this. Physics simulator has been kind of exposed outside of MoGraph, and you, it's something you don't need MoGraph for anymore. So do you get, can you do you, get, do you gain any advantage by jumping back into MoGraph? Are there things that no, you I can't haven't. See? Well, I haven't really done it that much. I mean, I, what I find is I end up using a lot of MoGraph uh, elements uh, for this because it's easy to throw, to, you know, build up a whole bunch of things with MoGraph. But um, you may gain, gain those. The big thing you gain by t pulling it out is just a lot simpler. You know, it's just a, it's a much more straightforward thing. So. So if we add this cube, for instance, if I if I pop a cube up here, um, and uh, so so this cube, I have a cube, and a, let's let's make it a little bit more interesting. We'll, we'll add a uh, a sphere as well. So we'll have this cube and this sphere, and we'll we'll make the sphere a little higher. This will pull back. And uh, so now what we're going to do is, when the cube and the sphere, I'm just going to select those two, and I'm going to give them a simulation tag. So I'm going to tell them they are rigid bodies, and then I'm going to go into the plane. And with the plane, I'm going to set that up as a collider body. Now, that means it's not going to be affected by physics, but it, as far as it's not going to start falling. But it will act as something that you can actually collide into. Got it. So now, if we... Um, so, the immovable object. It becomes the immovable object, or one of the immovable objects. You can have a lot of them if you want. So here you can see the two of them just kind of fall down on top of the plane. Um, so there's not much to that. Now, the interesting thing is, is that as we go through that process, for instance, we can pull back here. And uh, we can jump up here, and let's take the sphere, for instance. And you can see that there's a dynamics body. So I have, you know, inside of this, uh, you know, have dynamics, collision. Uh, I can have a lot of different controls. I can give it a, um, uh, so for instance, I can say uh, this collision. I, right now the bounce is 50, but I can make that, that bounce, you know, if I make it over 100, it's going to actually get more energy from the bounce it's not quite. No. So then bounce is controlling the elasticity of the collision. Yes. So now the bounce is here is, is 105, but that's being multiplied to the bounce that is our, also sitting inside of the plane. So the plane is only 50%. Now if I set this to 100% now, the sphere should just keep on, it'll slowly bounce more. Because of course this, the bounce in the plane and the bounce in the sphere uh, are being multiplied to calculate its, uh, the dampening. So. So, you, so now it's it's got a slightly more it's got slightly more bounce than than the gravity than gravity gave it. So it's a little better than perfectly elastic. Right now it is, yeah. And and and, and you know, there's a lot of you know as these things start to. I should say inelastic. Any, it's an inelastic, yeah. And so it's so the um, now what you can do, of course, is you know the things that get kind of fun is let's take this sphere, let's get rid of the sphere for a second. And one thing is because it's a simulation, you kind of usually want to go back to the beginning. Uh, and um, let's take this object and we're going to make it a little bit smaller. So let's make it 50 by 50 by 50 by 50. And this is where you can start playing, having some fun with MoGraph. So um, if we take, if we build a uh, grid clone, for instance, uh, in MoGraph here, for some reason I didn't uh, want to do a cloner. There we go. 
and we'll group it to the cloner. Now there's three of those, that's fine, but let's say we want to do more. And let's say we actually, instead of doing linear, linear we want to do a uh, grid array. And what's cool is you start getting a whole bunch of these, and, um, and what we can actually do here is, let's say we want to, um, you know, we can uh, move these up a little bit. So we have these all sitting here. Now, this has got the physics sim on it, uh, so if we hit play, they all start dropping and then they all start hitting each other. And how they interact and how much they slide, for instance, you know, really depends on, on what you give it. Now, there is some noise being calculated into the calculation, so you see some of them kind of wriggling. So, um, and you can also do, you know, there's a lot of, um, for instance, you can give them more mass. You can also, um, you can start them with a, a uh, you know, initial... Um, you know, directions if you want to give them kind of a coax uh, one way or the other. So, so there's a lot of little bits of things that you can kind of have some fun with as you, as you put it together. But it's actually a pretty, I was kind of, um, uh, you know, it's an interesting, um, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's got enough pieces in it that, that you can actually have some fun with it. And to assign different um, masses or different attributes to different objects, you would just, you would have a different cloner group then. Yes, yes, if you wanted to have a mixture of the two. Uh, and here you can see that there is a world density. I could do a custom density or custom mass uh, to change how that, you know, how that looks. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and they can, um, I haven't done this yet, but let's, uh, just for fun, let's take this cube and give it a um, soft body. This is just a slight, the cube is not a, not a particularly good example. It's, it's kind of doing a different calculation. Now, this can get more complicated than what we're doing here. If we, if we grab one of these uh, cracked eggs, this is my cracked egg here. Um, what I did here is I actually used an explosion effect. So, so what I want to do is, is, is bust this egg up. Now, the funny thing about this is I used the, the, the old FX you know, explosion, explosion plugin right. and shattered the egg and then left it there. You know, oh, so okay. I shattered it into a whole bunch of little pieces, and then I gave all of those pieces the dynamics. Got it. And then what you can do is, with these all selected, you can decide, you can say, I want to trigger on a collision. So when I get a collision of a certain trigger velocity, then I'm going to, you know, activate the dynamics. So that's what's actually happening here. So I'm not, like, animating this turned on. What I'm doing is I'm waiting for that to... Now what I can do here is, if I turn up this um, trigger velocity, for instance, and I run this through... Let's see, once we get to the other side. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so there's not enough, so it, you know, there's not enough trigger velocity for it to, you know, figure that out. So it's just like, uh, no, I'm just going to stop. So there's a lot of fun you can have with, uh, you know, making that work. Now you can get into, um, I think I have a couple other, uh, let me see here if I can uh, pull these out. Um, I love physics and kinematics especially. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm I, you know, this is... Um, this is when things are getting a little, little sillier. So I, I, I started, you know, I'm, I'm really into things that throw things. So, um, so here is a, this is a trebuchet. So this is all using the physics that are, that are you know, within the, the project. So, so instead of having something colliding, I'm actually, you know, this is, what's amazing about this is that you can actually, you know, so what I did is took the very little I know about trebuchets and, um, and so I have a weight here that's being attached, you know, to this. Right. This is sitting on a hinge, so it's, it knows where it needs to rotate. So this weight, and then you start changing the mass of the weight, you know, the mass of this and these pieces, and it starts yes. changing all the rules. But, you know, I got to a point, like, you figured out how big that cone had to be to make sure that it had a forward velocity. You know, it goes through there. And I, on another version of this, I have, you know, little, you have a little wall there, and then the ball hits it and then drops the ball off. But if the weight's too heavy, or if the ball's too heavy, or if the ball's too light, it flies up in the air, it goes the wrong way. So it's, it's a really fun little, um, you know, classroom exercise. And you can tell, like for instance, when you have it selected, you can see these, um, these axes that are there. And one of the things you can tell is that when it's rocking back and forth, you can tell that it's not an efficient um, oh. hurl. You know, because you have, the, the ball theoretically has some energy where it's rocking back and then rocking forward. And that's not, that's not totally, that's not as efficient as you could, you know, project that. Okay, well, I see it spinning, and I was thinking, well, you no, no, assigned no, it's, some... It's, it's spinning when it's flying off, but when right. it's being, when it's still, when it's still on the oh, arm. Oh, yes, I see, right. When it's rocking back and forth, that's telling us that it's not being cleanly accelerated. Got it. You know, to that, 
to that end. And you understand, you get very clear when you start building something like this why they had that big slingshot that was um, that was there. So um, so anyway, so it's a it's a very uh, um, yeah, it's kind of a fun little little piece there. So um, one of the other questions. Um, uh, does it enable, does it support corner and edge deformation, uh, enable uh, dynamic, uh, this is from Chris Tuttle, uh, dy dynamic dents and chipping? You know, I haven't really done a lot with a dynamic dents and chipping. There is um, some facility for soft body dynamics, and I haven't really, haven't really tested it much yet. So, um, you know, I just started playing with this, and so I've been, um, these, are, these are kind of my early, uh, my early, uh, fast. We're, we're definitely going to show more of this um, as we, uh, uh, I don't even know what I did here. This was, oh, this was me. Uh, connecting a whole bunch of s balls with springs, and then dropping them on a on a piece of, on a stairway. So you can also set up a bunch of relationships that go on between the two. And and I haven't tried to do um, a uh, um, you haven't tried to do much more than that yet. But as far as the chipping goes, I know you can get do, do soft body where things are going to be kind of rubbery and you know kind of pulling together. Um, and I'm not and I haven't played with that too much yet. So if I understand the question right, wouldn't you have to fracture parts of the piece yeah. before? Yeah, I think you'd like have to pre-fracture pre something. Predefine and your chips. Set. Yeah, and you'd have to kind of uh, use something like the explosion effects or, or other tools to, there's a couple plugins you can also get that'll fracture that. So you'd have to pre-fracture it and then let it break off, uh, you know, or pre-fracture a segment of it. I don't think it'll, right now, I don't think it would take the whole mass and then fracture it without that. And then each would be a, would be tied to a collision event, maybe a different collision event? Possibly, yeah. You know, or or you could have it like a square. You could have them all sit. Well, but you could have them all sitting up where they're. You could have chunks built, knowing where things are going to hit, and then when they and then wait for them to be triggered right. by an, a collision. Yeah, right. a collision event. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another question here. This is from Matthew uh, Thane. Can you suggest any free or low budget VFX software for the beginner VFX editor? Um, I have to say that. that the number one piece of software that I would suggest if you want to start doing some visual effects, especially when it comes to compositing, would be Motion, Apple's Motion. If you don't have a PC, if you have a PC, I don't have a strong uh, suggestion for a very inexpensive version. I don't know what there is on the PC side that's as inexpensive. But Motion is $50, and um, we did 200 visual effects shots for a feature 200. film. Right. In motion. <laughs> so, so, so it is a very, very, I mean, and, and they weren't all, I mean, a lot of them were green, 105 of them were green screen shots, but they were pretty complex. I mean, we did some pretty complex work in, in motion, you know, we to were. do that. And we chose motion because it was faster. It was just fast. You know, literally, I mean, we had, we had shake on every machine and we chose motion because inside the budget that they had, uh, it was, it made more sense to do it in, in motion. So number one thing I would say is, is motion. Um, you know, I see people do stuff in Blender and I don't, don't really understand. Um, as far as like, it's free and you can do it and people do it. I don't, I don't, I, I don't, I haven't used it. When I open it up, it makes me a little crazy. Um, but, but that's a, it's a possible uh, thing to look at as far as doing visual effects stuff. Um, as far as uh, more affordable 3D packages, none of them are really, really affordable, but Moto and, 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 um, and Cinema 4D are the two that we are, you know, in that price point. Um, probably the most excited about. Uh, and really, those are the two bread and butter, you know, for what we do. Uh, we add XSI for some of the higher end stuff and for some of the character work. But, you know, even the character work in Cinema 4D is, is actually really good. Um, but those are, I mean, really, you could do 90%, 95% of what the average person would ever need inside of one of those two applications. Moto is, I think, a little bit faster. We find it faster to model in. And now they've added lots of camera stuff and great renderings and, and physics and replication and all these other things. Um, and so they're kind of slowly moving down that path. Uh, cinema is a really easy package to learn and, and build up, and it's not, not as expensive. Uh, it, it's more expensive than Moto and a full package, but, um, but, it is, uh, but it's not as expensive as some of the other options. Well, every so often I'm tempted to go uh, and look into Blender. And I don't do it because I'm, I have anything against Blender, I just mm -hmm. don't have the time. Right. But uh, last time I was tempted, I heard that they had uh, added a fluid simulator package, and that was about the time we were doing a project where mm -hmm. we had some cloudy fluid we needed to do. Right. But I found a way to do it in motion. Um, it might not have looked as good as it would have in Blender, but time was of the essence. I just, I just didn't get to it. Sorry, Blender. <laughs> and and I have to say that you, you know, some of the rendering that uh, that I've seen in Blender is pretty outstanding. So you know, I I, I hesitate to say that it is not. Um, I hesitate to say that it's not a, uh, you know, it's not a viable thing. You see a lot of great, 
um, you know, great, uh, great renderings out of Blender, and it was, and it's just one of those things that, uh, uh, but that it's a great. I think it's a good place to, you know, to start playing around with with stuff if you don't have the money to uh, invest in that. If you're a student, one of the things to remember is that Autodesk is very aggressive about uh, right. making their tools available. So that is something you always have to consider is that Autodesk, uh, if you're a student, college student, high school student, the thing to remember is that you can get uh, Autodesk for, uh, you know, and this is like basically, you get access to Smoke and Motion Builder and Maya and XSI and, and uh, 3D Studio for three years. Three years, three that's huge. years. <laughs> that's quite, <laughs> you that's sign a, if you're a student <laughs> for like a month, you know, at, at an accredited school, that's all it takes. So, so you definitely want to, um, Take that into account. In three years, if someone applied themselves, they could probably learn them all. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so uh, it's a pretty amazing, um, uh, amazing opportunity uh, inside of uh, what they're doing. And so, Houdini also has a great. Houdini is pretty heavy, deep, pretty deep water. Um, but it is, uh, but it's also like a hundred dollars for the apprentice thing. And there's some really aggressive student things. I think that um, there's a 30-day version of Moto. There's a 42-day version of Cinema R13 that you can download. I, I don't know where 42 days came from, but it, I, I, I just, know where I was 42 just, days came from. Where did 42 days? Well, I, I I imagine it's well. I like to think it's a reference to the ultimate answer to life, the universe, and everything. You know, and and the, and the guys at Maxon are the kind of guys that would do it 42 days just because it is the ultimate answer. And they I do would know it that. every chance I get. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but those are great ones to play with. Um, do you have any recommendation? This is from Joshua Welt. Um, uh, do you have any uh, recommendations of resources to learn compositing from basic to advanced? So uh, the there's certain books that we generally almost always recommend um, that you get started with. Uh, the first one is um, uh, what we call the the good book. Of, the first one you you kind of want to read to kind of get a sense of things is what we call the good book of Brinkman. Uh, which is Ron Brinkman's um, the uh, the art and science of uh, digital compositing. Yep, I have that. You kind of want to read that. That's kind of a background, you know. Just gives it's a, it's a lot of theory. It talks about a lot of pieces, and it's all the stuff that you need to know. You got to know. You got to know what's in that book. Um, the second one is uh, the Good Book of Wright, <laughs> uh, which is uh, uh, Steve Wright's um, uh, book on it's it's uh, digital compositing. Uh, I think science. it's digital compositing for television and film. Yeah, digital compositing for tele television and film. And um, and uh, that one, what's interesting about that one is if you have a nodal compositor or have access to a nodal compositor, whether it's uh, whether it's Shake or whether it's um, uh, Nuke or or, or uh, Conduit is a good one. That's our that's our application. Um, but you can get you can download the you know the demo version of Conduit or the free version of Conduit that that you can that you can play with. But one of the things that you can do is, is Steve has a bunch of node little structures and just rebuild each one of them. I mean, the idea is if you read Ron's book and then you take Steve's book and you open up Conduit and then you, or Shake or any of these other ones, and Shake isn't really around much anymore, but Nuke or, or um, Digital Fusion or whatever you have there, and you put the, or you can do it in XSI, I mean, it's got a little nodal compositor in there, but any nodal compositor you use there, you can um, rebuild what Steve did, you know, in each one of them, you know, grab some images off of his disk and then rebuild those pieces. Uh, and um, the uh, what's great about that is that by the end of it, you'll really understand the process and you'll understand that compositor. And what I really liked about Steve's book is he showed you the arithmetic steps to do the process. So if you wanted to do it with a pencil and paper or a calculator, you could do it. Right. Yeah. So that when it, when it came time to solve a problem, it was a lot easier to get into rolling your own yeah. Uh, composite. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and. Uh, See, we talked about Chris Tuttle's. Uh, what is a typical way that Cinema 4D is integrated into the Final Cut 10 workflows? You know, I, I have to admit, I haven't actually done too much of the Final Cut Pro uh, 10 workflows with Cinema yet, so I don't know exactly the best way to do it. I know that in the past version, we've been able to um, literally render out a motion project, you know, out of out of Cinema and open it with all the layers and all the other pieces are all right. You know, you can render out all the passes and everything else right into um, into Nuke, um, into, I believe Nuke, um, Shake, um, Motion, uh, After Effects, 
just just send them all, all those layers out, and then you can tweak the composite and move things around. Right. If you wanted to do that in in those in those layers, you can also do that for Photoshop. It's one of the reasons that Cinema specifically is so popular among graphic artists because graphic artists a lot of time want to do weird things with their renders. They don't want just a pure render. They want to. I want some of this stuff, and I want a bunch of alpha channels so I can in integrate it with a bunch of other things. And um, the the best application for that right now is is, is Cinema as far as exporting lots and lots of passes uh, easily. A lot of the tools can do it, but none of them you can just none of them can you, can you turn on at that level um, and, and just export it out. It's been very popular that way. As soon as I learned passes, I was never happy with rendering it out in one one go again. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. You know, passes are one of those things that it's hard to get your head around, like nodal compositing to some degree. But once you go down that path, you know, when I rendered a, um, I used to render I, for a period of my life, I rendered a big shiny uh, ship, you know, for a long time, and it was like. 30 some passes. I mean, well, it was you know 18 to 20 passes to start with, and and, uh, and you know and, and it's really becomes this artistic thing where you just kind of blend all that stuff in for each shot and each you know piece to kind of get it exactly the way you want it to look. And, and what's interesting is is that the the most people think of the 3D application when they're doing visual effects as the center of their workflow, but it's really the compositor. Compositing is the center of the workflow, and then the 3D application simply passes passes <laughs> right. um, you know to to that compositor to be finished. Um, you know, and, and sometimes there's a more, they're more complete and sometimes they're less complete. Uh, but it, when you start thinking of it that way, it gives you a much more creative pipeline. It's also why 3D artists really need to learn compositing because you need to know what you can and what you can't do uh, in that process. Um, and it bugs me when some 3D packages don't give you the layers that you want or make it very yeah. hard to go in and, and, and yank the layers out that, that you really need. And you really, yeah, it is so frustrating, you know, a lot of, a lot of, uh, 3D packages uh, don't uh, make that easy, you know, or you have to have a separate plugin or a separate script or a separate whatever, and that is something that is just key, you know. Now, I love the way XSI does it in some ways where you have, I can run all those passes and actually do a composite inside of XSI, so I can say, I want these passes here, and then I want them to blend them. You can do the nodal composite hmm. in XSI of all those passes and control all, all the, how those passes get integrated, you know, from your 3D package and do a lot of creative things inside of the actual application and then look at the, the render, you know, the render can be, you know, passing that, that preview um, of how all those pieces come together. So that's a kind of an interesting, uh, another That's interesting great. way of putting it together. So it's uh, um, one of the questions, another question, um, how do you uh, uh, color correct, um, <clears throat> how do you color correct a Cinema 4D uh, sequence to match a live action shot? You know, one of the things, if we're going to do a live action shot, if we're going to match a, a, a sequence into that, um, one of the things that um, uh, that we uh, that we do is we tend to make sure that we get anytime we can, we're going to try to get a HDR of the of the scene that we're going to be doing. So we're going to if we're going if we have a live action shot, we're going to shoot that shot. Um, we also generally want to get a bunch of different camera angles so that we know what happened. Now we get camera angles so that we can go into PhotoFly. And, uh, <laughs> right. Yeah, you know, you get a whole bunch of camera angles in PhotoFly, and then you can rebuild a 3D model of it so that everything's inter integrated. Um, when, when four angles isn't enough, I want 50. Right, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so we get a whole bunch of, you know, and, and you can see some of the, the tests that I've done on that. And so, so the, um, uh, so anyway, so with, um, uh, with photo, you know, PhotoFly gives you the models, but then you can take a, you know, shoot either three, I like, I prefer nine exposures uh, in, in six different directions on a, on a fisheye, stitch those all back together into an HDR, and that's going to give me a pretty good sense of what that color, you know, what the lighting was like. Right. Now, I may, it's going to get me close to the coloration that I need. Uh, final coloration, in my opinion, you don't color correct in your 3D package. You get close in your 3D package, and then you finish that off in your compositor, whether that, that is, uh, whether you're going to finish it off in After Effects or Smoke, uh, you know, um, We've been really doing a lot of experiments with using smoke to do the kind of color correction there, um, you know, to, to tie all that stuff back together. There's a lot of powerful tools there for finishing. And so, um, so those are, uh, you know, or, or motion or final cut. Um, but you're not going to do your final color correction um, in your 3D package. You're just going to try to get it into the, same, into the same ballpark so that you can, you can play. So doing it in the 3D package, that would be slow. Yeah, and, and that's the thing you have to remember is that the, 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 you uh, one of the things when we're talking to um, uh, artists, uh, one of the things that we get into is is that you know there is, I my opinion is that twenty percent of your work product is due to your skill. 
<laughs> and people get really into like what application they're using and, and how well they know it. And it is important to know it. I mean, that's an important 20%, but it's about 20%. 40% is your eye, whether you can see what's good or bad. Uh, there's so many people that know everything technically about how to use an application and they just don't know what's important. You know, they don't know uh, what you know what's important and what's not important. Um, and then the other 40% is the number of iterations. How many times are you going to get to see it? How many, how many times do you get to, to, to look at what you're doing um, uh, to make that decision? And so when you combine those, those are the things that really are the things that, that get you to the end, that end product. And a lot of people think of that end product being it's all skill and it's all, but it's really your eye and your iteration rate. And so when you do everything in your 3D package, a lot of times you're slowing your iteration rate down dramatically. Right. So fail early and often. Exactly. And we used to, you know, I still, I still render, like when I'm doing tests of renders, I'm rendering these little postage stamps. You know, like, and we, and I, you know, and I have to admit, you know, when, when I, uh, I think the current iPhone, the new iPhone 4 is one gigahertz or something like that. I mean, it's like some crazy, is that right? No, is it? Oh, I, it's got a gig of RAM. Yeah, well, but it, no, it's, but the, what's the speed of the processor? Do they ever talk about the A5 processor? I think it's one or what? I think it's a dual chip one. Just, just put it this way. I rendered shots for a big space film with 240 megahertz max. So, you know, the, you know my, my iPhone is four times faster in, in, and arguably eight times faster uh, and has a lot more RAM. I had to write a three-page paper to go from 128 megs of RAM to 192 megs of RAM. You know, talk about, you know, so, so the thing, I, people have heard me complain about that before, but, you know, hey, you little kids, you know, I used to have to go to the school backwards through the snow, up five miles of, of rain. Um, but the, uh, um, uh, but the thing is, is that, so you got really used to being efficient about your, about what you were doing. You got really, you know, the little, you wanted the little postage stamp to make sure that, you know, because you're going to wait for that render. And so you, you keep on doing all these little tests and you do these little, little bits of things. And then finally you would, um, uh, decide that's what I want, you know, and you'd render out a couple, like you, first you'd do a whole bunch of postage stamps and then you would do passes for one frame. You know, 18 frames or 18 passes. At full or 20, size. At full size. So you can or see. half size, okay. usually. Even that you didn't want to uh -huh. spend a lot of time on. So you get, you'd run that over lunch. So postage, frame, postage stamps in the morning, you know, for, you know, and then at lunch you'd run the one frame or a couple frames or whatever, and you'd do a little test wire frame. And then you would do a bunch of, you know, a couple more test renders to fit, fix whatever was not working you'd had the afternoon. And then at 5.30 you'd start compiling your, your, your passes. And so for an hour, you'd be setting up all your ins and outs on with this on and this on. Because it wasn't like cinema. It was like, you know, turn all these things off, and then I'd save out another project file, and I'd, uh, and it was a whole this, this, this right. rigmarole to get it all done. Then you would, um, uh, um, so then you'd, then you'd put that all together, and then you would set it off at 6.30, and then you'd come in at 7.30 in the morning before, you know, because... Dailies was at 8.30, and so at 7.30 in the morning, you'd come in, and you'd take all the passes, and if you were, if you were lucky, you named them all correctly, and you open up your After Effects file and relink them, and then, and then hit render on After Effects, and then run over to Dailies and watch Dailies for half an hour, see everybody else's film shots. Then you'd come back, and it had finished rendering, and then you'd look at it, and then, you'd, you'd, and then your effects supervisor would walk over, and they'd look, at, they'd look at it, and you'd take some notes, and they'd take some notes, and then you'd work all morning rendering a bunch of little postage stamps, and then you'd render a frame, and then you'd do it all over again. <laughs> <laughs> it was the VFX rat race, you know. So, so. Right. Um, but what's funny is, is that when you work with a lot of when you work with a lot of artists, they're just trying to do these these really high high resolution things all the time. All their tests are big and all the you know everything else, um, and that isn't. It's just very slow. And so I'm still rendering like little stills of things to make you know because even though it's, now it's 30 seconds instead of a minute or two minutes or three minutes it's, or or five minutes to run that little that little uh, piece. You know, it's 30 seconds or 10 seconds or whatever, but I can see it and I can make a decision. I can make those decisions quickly. Right. And then I'm going to do all the, then I, you know, I'm going to slowly, you know, big funnel. A whole bunch of decisions all down to a handful and then, and then it comes out the other end, you know. And um, so anyway, um, question from uh, Chris Tuttle. How do you handle live shot reflections in Cinema 4D objects? Asking Kevin. Oh, my. Um, uh, an image map is a light source? Yeah, I mean, HDR is, I mean, if you're doing still reflections, then, the, then, you're, then your piece is going to be HDR. You know, that's the, so you're gonna, you, you want to get an HDR out of that. Um, 
if you are doing a... I was thinking moving reflections. Yeah, if you're doing moving reflections, then a lot of times what you what you want is to get something. Remember, the thing is with reflections is they're not usually very sharp. You just need something that looks right. So a lot of times, you know, in the past, I've done ones where we actually take another camera and we hide it right off the screen. So if someone's reaching over to grab, you know, you know, you got to figure out where the reflection is. Sure. And even if you're zooming in a little bit or you're moving over, you know, if they're going to grab onto something, either put a ball there and get that whole reflection, you know, so that you can right. see it. Um, or have something that's, that's shooting up that's going to grab the person looking at it so that you can then put that you know, out there and reflect back on it. Sounds great. Um, but those are the kind of things that you, you know, to try to get that working. Because once again, if you just see something that looks large, if it's really slow and right at them, you're going to have to do something specialized. But a lot of times, you know, you can fake a lot. So here I was thinking reflections on a shiny ship. Yeah, well, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> that was... Um, yeah, there's a there's a uh, placing reflections. There's a, there's an old DB Garage tutorial. I'm gonna actually rebuild some of the DB Garage tutorials for uh, you know in the new in the in the new year, uh, just because they're old and they were old, you know old applications okay. and so on and so forth. But one of the ones was that uh, I was trying to figure out how to. I had this big shiny ship, and um, and I was trying to figure out how to um, get an explosion to. So I had a 2D explosion that I needed to get to go across the top of a you know, to, to, that you want to see on the ship. Yes. But it turns out that, you know, when you have a curvy ship and then you have the, the entire world around it, figuring out exactly, like you can spend a lot of time just kind of moving this, you know, oh, building, because right. what you did is you build a movie that's, you know, um, let's say a thousand by 500 or 2000 by a thousand. And you got to figure out where to put this explosion and what size to make it to, so that it'll show up on the ship in the correct place. Right, because it's a fun house mirror that's moving. Exactly. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, so, so what? Uh, this, you know, so I was, um, I was, uh, uh, I think it's the technical term. I was convincing um, to my to my uh, visual effects supervisor, a guy named John Knoll. I think a lot of people here watching. If you're watching Inside the Black Box, you know who John Knoll is. And um, John uh, uh, shared some, you know, wisdom, which was to take. We went into. Uh, let's see if I can do it. Let's see if I have um, pop up Photoshop here. No, oh, don't show my, my screen yet. No, okay, hold on a second. Um, but there was this, uh, it's, it's a, it was um, a, you know, it's one of those little uh, moments that was very uh, informative. So the idea is, is you have to figure out where in a texture map um, you need a reflection to appear on a 3D object. But you, the only way to do that is to actually run the 3D, um, you know, you have to render it. Right. You render the 3D object with a reflection map so that you can see where it's actually going. I mean, you can try to do maps and, and stuff, but you really need to reflect something. So you need to put an you need to put a image. How do you build an image? And, and there's images people would use. They'd have ones with little quadrants named and sure. everything else. But the problem is, is that if it's a really if it's a fun house and it's weird, it just all kind of right, breaks up. And just, and it's all stretched out. You can't figure out what that means. And sometimes it's like one a handful of little pixels are being stretched over the entire surface, you know, or, or of one area. And so, so um, the uh, the solution uh, turned out uh, once it's uh, not. Um, why is it initializing the type tool? All right. So you create a uh, you create something that's 256. You could build it bigger now, but let's just say 256 by 256. And um, and so it takes a little while because everything is slow. All right. So um, so now you have a uh, you have this image here, and we're going to go into the channels, and um, we're going to go into the red channel, and we're going to take a gradient, and this will be uh, black to white. And let's um, pop this up here like this, and we're going to. Uh, anyway, so we're going to. Um, I just love the fact that. That spotlight. I, I forgot. I keep on the, on this computer. I don't have it set up where sc spotlight turns on every time I want to zoom in. All right. So we do a do a gradient like this. And that one's a circular gradient. That's not what we want. So let's do a gradient like this. Okay. So white to black. Let's actually do it the other way. It's easier. So we do a gradient like this. And I'm not being super precise, um, but we'll go into the green channel, and we'll go. Is. All right, so what's interesting about this image that we, we just created, if we actually look at um, our info here, what we're going to notice is that at the top, I, I wasn't totally precise, but at the top, my red and green values, so the values over here, um, 
my red and green value at this top corner is actually uh, 0 and 0. And if I go to the other side, it's, it's 255, 255. We're very close to it. So what you have is an image that all you do is you take this image <laughs> and you put it into a reflection map you know, around your object, and then you just render. Like, you turn off everything else. Turn off specular, turn off diffuse, turn, make it purely reflective. And then you just render your entire image out. And what you end up with is this kind of rainbowy looking thing. But you can actually open it in After Effects or Motion or, or Smoke or whatever. Sample the, sample the actual render, and it will tell you, it'll give you an XY. The coordinates of It'll give you the coordinates of where in the texture map that, what, your, what your sampling is. And um, it's pretty darn accurate. And so, and so then it, it takes something from a lot of guesswork and a lot of hocus pocus down to just, it just works. That's pretty brilliant. Yeah. Um, John Knoll is pretty good at that. The brilliant part, um, often and um, surprisingly often. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. so anyway, uh, you know, so um, he knows a lot about Photoshop too. So, you know. so anyway, um, uh, another question from Car Carolyn. Um, it, it, w the question is, uh, uh, how important is reference, um, uh, and does it really make a difference to? Uh, in final work. So the answer is reference is not only, if you're, if you're reproducing something in the real world, reference is not um, important, it's absolutely important. It is, un, uh, it is the number one, uh, for those of you in the Pixel Core who are watching, um, the, uh, uh, the thing that you should um, know is that when I, um, if I don't think you're doing a very realistic uh, render, it usually, the way I talk to you about that as I go, so do you have any reference for this? <laughs> and so that's, that's code. That's code for, that. yeah, you're not even, we're not going to, like there's, I, 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 don't need, I don't need to have this conversation with you yet because you're not, you know, I want to see it. When I'm, when I'm doing a physical object, I literally have the phys a picture of the physical object and I have my render. And usually I, rend I put it as a background object in, in whatever, in either Moto or Cinema 4D or whatever else I'm using to, to do the render. I have that as a background object and I'm rendering my object right next to it and I'm trying to match that lighting in the exact same way and make sure, and I want to get to a point where I can barely tell the difference between the two. And, and it is, it really takes a lot of the guesswork out of it when you're trying to reproduce an object if you have lots of reference. And, and so, you know, um, and if you're not doing something that, um, if you are not doing a, um, um, with a, with a reference object, when you're, when you're absolutely having to make something look exactly like something else, you simply, you render it, and then you simply do a, uh, you, you, you look at the real one, you look at yours, and if you have your camera at the same angle and everything else, you simply render it, and then you write, you take a list, you make a list of what's different. That one's a little shinier, that one's a little, mine's a little cleaner, mine's a little this. Mine, you just make that list, and then you fix that list, and then you render it again and then you make another list. <laughs> then you fix that list, and then you render it again, and then you make that list. And what's amazing is, it doesn't take very long. You know, you, know, you, you just, you sure. know, and, and what you're also doing is, is you're training your eye. And one of the things that I, if you're watching and, and you've been one of the people who have complained to me about the fact that I'm, I, we need to do the observations again, the, the DB Garage, you know, daily observations, they are coming back. Those are another thing, there's another piece of the puzzle that hopefully will be back by November or December. Um, I'm trying to build a pipe that is a little bit more efficient to put those together. But um, anyway, so, uh, but those were like, you know, the idea of this process also makes you very good at just observing the world around you. And even if you see something every day or are very familiar with something, a person's memory um, isn't objective. Yeah. Um, it, it changes over time and it, yeah. it changes depending on what you think is important. Uh, I know you're familiar with the smokestack. Every morning when I drive through Berkeley, the, the there's, smokestack. there's a smokestack that's really productive. It's just going all the time, at least when I drive by. I don't get to see it for long every day. It's I'm steam, going at by 60 the way, miles an hour. Want, oh, it is it steam? It's not Great. smoke, it's steam. Because that would be illegal to put that much smoke into the air. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so if I were trying to um, even come up with colors for steam, for a steam plume, um, I think I know what steam looks like. But if I were to sit down and just try to animate it and then come up with a result that I thought looked good, I would probably be quite a bit off well, from, there's a lot from of what I saw. Well, about that steam that are, that's weird. Like, the edges look dark. Right, it looks like an error. Yeah, yeah, like, it's like, that, that looks like a rendering error. There's so many things in the real world that you look at and you go, that looks like a rendering error. You know, like, I don't think that those clouds were actually rendered properly, you know, or I don't think that the, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that, and those are the ones I think are the most fascinating of trying to reproduce, you know, put together. So it's, um, it's very interesting. 
Very interesting. Yeah, the, um, the question Chris Tuttle had here is how do you create a really good chrome uh, like uh, that used in the movies Transformers and the Abyss? You know, a lot of that is making sure... One of, one of the things, some of the stuff that makes good chrome, one is a conservation of energy, which means that when you, when you're, the more reflective an object is, the less diffuse it is. Got it. You know, because light is reflecting off of it, and it is, there's 100% of light coming in, you can't have the diffuse be high, diffu a lot of diffuse reflection, and then a lot of specular reflection. A lot of people forget to turn the, turn one down to make up for the other. Uh, now right. there's some then you'd be creating energy, and that's forbidden. <laughs> that's forbidden. That is forbidden. Um, so, uh, and I think that like, I think Moto has a switch that you can just kind of say concept, you know, and, and so it'll, I believe so, yes. it'll, and so when you're making those changes, it does it automatically. Um, but the, um, but being able, you know, so that's part of it. Um, another thing is uh, to remember that depending on the metal, the metal oftentimes will have a, if it has a color, it'll be related. So if it's a red diffuse color, it'll also be a red reflection, you know, for me metals tend to, tend to have that, uh, or some metals have that. Um, they're not, and then the, um, Another thing when it comes to that reflections is part of what makes reflections look great is actually the imperfections. So, right. you know, um, is lots of little grit and grunge and everything else. You can download some sample files, I believe, from DB Garage's website from the, the, the Surface Toolkit and play with those. Um, or you can go out and shoot your own. But grunge maps are a great way to kind of break it up a little bit. Uh, a little bit of grunge maps, a little bit of imperfection, um, those kind of things make something look really real. Um, a lot of times people's reflections are actually doing pretty well. Um, but the thing to remember is that, that, the, that the, in that grunge area, you're going to have it be a little less reflective and you're also going to have it be a little, the, the, the reflection itself is a little blurry. Now this is where multiple passes make a difference. You have a blurry pass, you have a, a, a sharp pass, and then you have a mat that's gonna, that you render with it as another layer right. that's going to let you define in your compositor which one is taking over. Got and you it. can kind of play with that, and you can play with how reflective things are. When you render this out in passes, I mean, I, I think it's very hard to do a good chrome purely out of a 3D. You can, but I think it's hard to do pure, chrome, great chrome purely out of your 3D package. Uh, the easiest way to do that is to render lots of passes and then blend them all together. Well, in the before time, in, in the long, long ago, I remember trying to play with in chrome. In the before time. <laughs> right. I remember trying to play with chrome in, in say, Lightwave, and just try to do it all in, in Lightwave. I didn't know anything about compositing. Right. And it took forever, and I was never really happy with it. Right. Yeah. 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 So the uh, um, so anyway, that's something to something to think about. Um, uh, another question here from Carolyn Stamping: uh, Can you explain the difference between uh, when m one might want to use uh, practical versus visual effects? For example, adding rain, uh, fire to a real world scene. Um, practical versus vi uh, versus well, I guess practical versus visual. I, I'm assuming practical versus CG. Um, um, if, I don't there's there's versus practical visual. versus visual versus C, uh, computer graphics, you know, versus special, you know, because right. visual effects, I mean, you might, like practical is we go out and shoot in the rain. <laughs> um, a, a, um, a visual effect might be that we shoot some water elements and then add those back on, but there's still a practical visual, but there's still a visual effect. We're compositing it together. Okay. Um, and then you have CG. We add CG rain, you know, and so uh, uh, my, uh, my opinion is that we use practical effects whenever possible. Whenever practical. <laughs> you know, whenever practical, you use practical effects. Whenever possible, you use visual practical effects. And when absolutely necessary, you use CG effects. Um, I don't think that, uh, I, th I, think C I think people oftentimes go to the CG too quickly. Um, I think, uh, you know, it looks realistic, but it doesn't look real oftentimes if we're not right. careful. Um, especially when directors, I just, what was the movie I just saw that, um, I just saw it directed by, oh, I don't know, I, I feel like, I feel very silly that I don't, that I don't mm -hmm. remember. It's, it's, it's directed by Kenneth Brenna. It's okay. a new visual effects, it's visual effects heavy. It was just in the theaters. Someone's going to remember what it is. I don't know. It was in the theaters, I think, recently. I haven't been to the theater in a Thor. while. Thor. Oh, So, right. uh, to me, Thor is a good example of something where there's an awful lot of scenes that look very realistic. They don't look real, you know. Like you know, they you know they don't they don't and and I think that uh, I think there was a little more you know it just there's that, that last little two percent three percent four percent that I just don't I don't feel like is really there you know and I think some of that comes from the director I think that some directors when they push it I think like uh, uh, you know you have a um, I mean because 
Kenneth Branagh is, is an incredible director. He's just not, he doesn't do a lot of CG heavy stuff. So I think that you have a level of detail that the director's not looking for. And without the director pushing for it, um, I think sometimes you're not gonna see that. I mean, uh, a, a director who pushes the CG all the way, of course, is, you know, when we look at Avatar, we're looking at something that looks very realistic. Um, and, and I, you know, there are times when I go, oh, it's okay, but, but 99.9% .9 of the time. When you look at, and, and, and when you have great visual effects supervisors, um, where you're looking at, uh, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean. When you're looking at some of those ones, you're looking at just almost a. I mean, both. There's a couple of them. They're just some of the best visual effects I've ever seen. You know, you know. Whereas, just it's seamless when you, especially when you realize that all those fish guys, they're not real, and the lighting is perfect, and the, the details are just right. And but that takes a it, it takes a certain visual effects supervisor it takes a certain director it takes a certain that is going to be uncompromising and it takes a certain company i will say that you know there's only a handful of companies whether it's uh, dd weta ilm uh, uh the mill there's a you know I, i'm sure i'm frame store I'm, I'm sure i'm forgetting a couple of them that there's only a handful of big companies that i think can consistently for a feature film do that level of work uh, the rest of us are doing Smaller effects, <laughs> you know, and, and we can do it for a shot maybe, uh, but but to do that kind of level, I think that's what that's why those big guys aren't going away anytime soon, um, because they're just the only ones capable of. And I think there's more of them. I think we're seeing better. I, I think uh, um, uh, there are because um, I'm missing some. There are some Canadian uh, and some other UK ones that I think that are getting up there pretty quickly too. So is their iteration rate just higher, and they can start spinning at the end and. I guess I would say their iteration rate is very high, but I also think that one of the things that you get with scale is, as an artist, that's important. For a big company, uh, one of the things you get is just the scale of, you don't have to do a lot of iteration because you know, you don't have to do as much iteration because there is a way that this gets done. You know, there's a oh, system, there's right. a pipeline. There's a, but there is some incredible tools at a lot of these companies that give them incredibly fast iteration. And when I say iteration, I do the, the, the ability to just kind of free flow an incredible amount of information. You know, into that into that system where they you know they can block things out very fast and put those together. So we're running out of questions, and I think we're, we've we've actually gone. This has been a I think a fairly interesting little discussion um, as we've uh, kind of worked, worked through it. Uh, Kevin Hansen, <laughs> yeah, uh, it was good. Just, just here to keep me keep me company, talk about stuff, talk about. He's 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 our one of our uh, top visual effects artists here at Pixcore, and uh, does a lot of the, uh, a lot of the work on the projects. Um, I, I think that. Kevin, Kevin, in some places, has passed me. It, well, it's been a journey, yeah. and um, I, have, I still have big gaps. I am where I am, but it's been great. I think everybody has gaps. I think we're all, there's no way to remember, know it all anymore. You, know, you just know what you know. So, um, so I think we're, we're running to the end there. So I, what I want to do, of course, is thank everybody for, uh, for watching our little live stream. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, again, uh, as a reminder, and I'll answer this one, last one, Chris, here in a second, but uh, just as a reminder uh, that... Um, uh, next week we're going to have uh, final uh, Mac Break uh, Studio, and we're going to have Mark Spencer and uh, Steve uh, Steve Martin in here. And then the week after that we have uh, Frederick Johnson doing a, a shoot for for uh, Twip Live. Um, so a lot of stuff coming up there. And then Gear Media Tech starts it all off again in November. So uh, so stay tuned for that. And um, uh, future of real time visual effects in August uh, this year. This is from Chris Tuttle again. In August of this year, during SeaGraph 2011, they demo technology on the Xbox Connect. Uh, that was using capture in real time, a real world set that was overlaid with rendered objects. Have you seen this? Um, I haven't seen this one. This stuff has been becoming very close. Um, getting close to visual effects in simple structures, I mean, not like Transformers level, but um, getting close to that has been kind of building. We've been doing uh, motion, real motion capture embedded into photogrammetry scenes uh, since 2004, 2005. Um, but this is definitely at a whole different level. The Xbox, I think, is a good example of that. Um, and I think we're definitely going to see a lot more of that. Uh, do we get to the point where we're re reproducing Avatar uh, in real time? Maybe someday, uh, but I think we're still quite a ways away from the rendering power that's required to make that happen. Um, but I could see it 10 years from now, 15 years from now, where we're able to do that. Uh, I think we will get 90% there in the next five, maybe you know, five years or so, we'll get, uh, you know, we'll have boxes that are capable of doing, of, of getting very close to the, where the average person wouldn't see the difference. I think the, they would see something might not be quite right, much like we, 
see in a lot of films. Um, but uh, but to get to that final absolute level where it's totally matching, I don't. I think it's, I think we're still a little ways away. Is that going to give us an excuse to have an Xbox in the office? You don't need an excuse. You just need to tell me you need an Xbox in the <laughs> office. We'll get an Xbox in my office. If I write a, we have uh, a big screen. <clears throat> we have a big screen over here. We we need to have. We really do need to have some kind of Xbox. Um, I could write a three-page report explaining why we need an Xbox. There you go. You have to. Everyone has to. Yeah, yeah. That's what they. You have to write a three-page report and, and justify it. And justify the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. The. Um, uh, um, yeah, that, 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 that would be great. Good. I really. People should eat a Twitter. You know, a tweet me if you're interested. I, I really think that we we need to do an Angry Birds. Um, <laughs> I really want to do an Angry Birds uh, tournament. I want to put it up on the big screen, and we'll you know we'll shoot the things. But I think an Angry Birds tournament would be awesome. It's actually I th I thought about it for a while, and it'd be much harder than I think it because it's you have to get it just right, and some of those levels you know takes quite some time. As not to brag, but as someone who has three stars on every Angry Birds <laughs> level in existence, I just want to say that it didn't come easily. There's a lot of scars on this hand that were required to get to three stars. Well, having all those gold stars, you'd come into the arena with your, your embroidered robe, you know, throw it off and your, yes. your fancy Angry Birds <laughs> outfit. Would that be like blue blue tights with a red, you know, <laughs> a big red Angry Bird? It could be, and you have to pick your your bird. You know, you're like, you're like you'll be the big fat red Angry Bird or the the bomb bird. We're not talking about visual effects anymore, are we? I think we should probably go now. So anyway, so thank you so much for uh, for tuning in, and until next week, uh, thank you very much for watching Inside the Black Box Live. <laughs>